thanks to uh, all of all of you for the opportunity to be with you here today. Um, we'll switch it up from the last presentation <laughs> a little bit, which I was listening uh, uh, intently to, and uh, we'll move a little more geeky, but I promise not to, to take it uh, uh, too deep and try to hit the right level. So, um, you know, we all have a, a mission, and in this case, you know, we're living in a world of increased capacity and increased uh, networking demands. And so the, the purpose and kind of the focus of this presentation um, was to provide some insights and some thoughts around evolutions in optical networking um, and where the optical transport network is headed. And the three themes I'm going to hit on here are compact optical um, systems, uh, embedded optical engines, and the advent of pluggable uh, optical technology, which is also emerging. And there's some new revolutionary technologies um, that are being pioneered in that um, uh, space. Um, I want to start off because I know everybody's not familiar with Infinera as a household name. <laughs> and so um, I don't want to assume that, uh, of course. And so just a little bit here. Um, um, the company was founded in uh, 2000. And uh, today we have about um, 3,000 employees. We're a global company, U.S.-based headquarters, um, and um, we have about 1.3 billion in revenue. Our focus as a company is designing, um, you know, the world's greatest optical subsystems, and uh, also the systems, if you will, that um, those optical engines and that optical transmission technology uh, go into. And uh, that's what our engineers and, and scientists and physicists and, and marketeers are, are certainly living uh, every single day. Um, most of our innovations and our um, um, advances come from something we call our Optical Innovation Center. And today's modern optical transmission technology um, is, is not that dissimilar in some ways from wireless technology where digital signal processing enabled the advent of, of complex modulation schemes where I can send more bits on a per symbol basis. Um, and that can help me get these higher bandwidths and higher capabilities to the handset. And the same is true over glass and fiber optics. We're living with coherent, dense wave division multiplexing. What does that mean? Multiple wavelengths over a fiber pair or a piece of glass that's uh, in a terrestrial market over land or in some cases submarine and under the ocean and sitting on the bottom of the, of the ocean floor. So how, do, how does that technology work and how does it come together? Well, it's a combination of analog optical front end and digital signal processing back end and then that has to be packaged together properly because we're talking about such high speeds and data rates um, like um, um, approaching 100 gigabaud uh, uh, as an example. And I'll show you a little bit of that here in the next uh, few slides. Um, so where do we do this? And, um, and a little bit of, of how we do it. Where does the Optical Innovation Center live? Well, Infinera is a little bit unique in that um, we have um, um, an indium phosphide fabrication and foundry facility as part of the company's um, capabilities. And that's been there um, uh, a, a long time in terms of that was kind of at the heart of the company's founding was this idea that we want to be deeply vertically integrated and we really want to control the key aspects of this optical engine technology. So in addition to designing um, the technology, we also have photonic integrated circuit and indium phosphide, which is wafer type technology that you build um, optical components onto. Um, we have that in, in Sunnyvale. Our digital signal processing uh, team home is, is um, uh, uh, anchored in uh, Ottawa. And then we bring that analog front end and the digital signal processing technology together in Allentown, Pennsylvania, um, where we have this um, high speed packaging uh, capability to, to ultimately create um, what we would call our infinite capacity engine 
um, which is a, a, a module that gets placed onto a, a sled or a, or, a, or a circuit board. Before we dive into compact, embedded, and pluggable, let's just take one step to level set, you know, the network and the purpose of the network. <laughs> you know, the reality is we are here as a transport network to do what? We're here to connect people and applications to the cloud and to each other. That's why we exist. And there's no services, whether it's streaming video or, um, or mission critical you know, communications, those services ultimately ride on a transport network. And that transport network is generally underpinned by um, optical transmission technology like we're talking about here, which is a coherent dense wave division multiplexing that underlies um, the other aspects of packet and services uh, on top of that. So we said at the beginning of this, we were gonna talk about three key um, themes from uh, where is this uh, industry uh, headed? And those three key themes are um, an evolution in compact modular uh, optical platforms. Um, the second theme is we're in this uh, kind of fifth generation wave of technology. People would refer to it also as 800 um, gig technology. That's because a single wavelength over a piece of glass can transmit um, 800 gigabit per second at a considerable distance or reach. And these optical engines are tunable such that we can dial down that, that baud rate and that bit rate from eight to seven to six and, and even smaller increments um, as we want the distance to go further and further. So they're really programmatic and they're really tunable uh, in this fifth generation. And again, we've got an analog front end and a digital signal processing back end, and that gives us this tunability and you know, all vertically integrated and designed um, by one company here, um, in this case, Infinera. Um, the third leg of the stool here is this revolution in coherent pluggable optics. Um, with Moore's law and transistor densities getting uh, better, and even though maybe Moore's law is dead from every 18 months, we double the transistors, we still see increases in density and capabilities. We went from, um, you know, today's technology is seven nanometer DSP technology. Um, we're on a journey to five nanometer and three nanometer. And so um, those things continue. And, uh, and so let's hit all three of these key themes. So compact modular optical platforms some of this began with kind of the web scale companies designing to create, um, you know, um, uh, almost appliance like devices that they were used to from a server perspective, but applied to optical networking. But today's, you know, evolution of that and compact modular platforms have NEBS compliance. They support 300 millimeter depth and 600 millimeter depth for different size rack, racks and office applications. Um, they have, um, you know, replaceable fan, replaceable power units, they have redundant controllers, and they have this modular sled based architecture that really lets you mix and match the functionality you want from transponders to switching to the optical layer itself that is uh, amplifying or combining um, the wavelengths to send uh, over the glass. On the software side, there's been a lot of work in the industry around open interfaces and standard data modeling. What's that about? That's about ease of integration into um, all kinds of different software environments. And the more we kind of standardize the way you get access to this information, whether it's programming down or telemetry up, um, you know, the easier it is for us to insert uh, new generations and, and, and new products. And uh, um, that's really where kind of this compact modular platform uh, evolution uh, is headed. In addition to that, um, modern platforms like our GX series also support this idea of embedded optical engines. Embedded engines typically higher performance and you see in the long haul and the submarine and, and into the metro space as well, higher performance, but also bigger size and, and more power. 
Um, but they also support the pluggables uh, technology in um, smaller form factors like CFP2 and QSFPDD, those kinds of packages that you can hold in your hand. And uh, you've seen, you know, plugged into uh, various uh, telecommunications uh, devices. So um, we've evolved compact modular um, platforms. We've also designed them to support a combination of pluggable technology and embedded optical technology, depending upon where in the network and the performance and the fiber scarcity um, as to if we need to eke out that last bit of performance or we are fiber rich and maybe we don't have to. And so we don't have to have the, the, the leading edge of, of performance. Infinera's Optical Innovation Center and our latest technology we call I6 for Infinite Capacity Engine um, 6 uh, version. We have, um, we have a number of uh, pieces of intellectual property that make this performance in real world networks happen at an amazing reach uh, versus prior generations. As an example, um, the Maria cable that goes between the United States um, and, and Europe, um, we put our I6 technology on that network, uh, on that you know, fiber um, submarine network, and we were able to deliver 650 gigabit per second with deployable margin at over 6,500 kilometers on a single wavelength um, for a total fiber capacity of 28 terabits over a fiber pair. We also tuned that and cranked it up a little to get 700 gig or 30 terabit per second over a piece of fiber, um, to a pair, fiber pair. Um, that was um, what we would label a hero experiment and, um, you know, with, with certainly less or, or virtually no deployable margin. So I just wanted to set an example of kind of what is it we're expecting from this technology. One of the key things underlying this is because of this digital signal processing combined with analog front end, um, we have something called Nyquist digital subcarriers, which is this. Instead of sending a 96 gigabaud stream as a single 96 gigabaud stream in a single wavelength, we actually can subdivide that in the digital domain, uh, or we'll call it frequency domain as well, but in the digital domain. And with that, we can send um, eight 12 gigabaud subcarriers in that wavelength. And it turns out that's beneficial. It's beneficial because we reduce chromatic dispersion and we el eliminate some of the nonlinear effects that happen as we crank that baud rate up and we try to accomplish that all with a single stream of traffic. It's an important point because we're going to make use of that in just a second when we get to the pluggables technology. So um, let's just take a look at, at and we'll move off this, this quickly, but here's the prior generations of technology in uh, coherent dense wave division multiplexing, which began at the 100 gig per wavelength era and is now at 800 uh, gig per wavelength, fifth gen. Um, but just take a look at these distances for a minute. Um, 800 gig at 800 kilometers. Um, we've already talked about a, a little bit of that, but now let's do a gen four, gen five comparison or a gen three, gen five comparison. Take a look at how far you could send the top or the max rate of these prior technologies. 400 gig went 300 kilometers and 600 gig went 150 kilometers. Now fast forward to fifth generation technology where 600 gig is 2,700 kilometers and 400 gig is virtually anywhere except for you know, Pacific subsea links, which might be 10,000 km, you know, 10, kilometers. So what a, what a significant step forward in terms of transmission ability per wavelength that we see in this fifth generation technology, which is now commercially available and, uh, and, and hitting the market. I'm gonna pivot from compact modular, embedded engines, and now we're gonna talk about pluggables for just a second. And so from a pluggables technology perspective, um, this Nyquist subcarrier was present and it's been in our systems, but it's, it's hidden, if you will. Well, what if we took these subcarriers and we were able to expose them and assign them to independent destinations or addresses? Well, 
you would create something um, from a technology perspective that's been called XR optics. What does that mean and what could you do with it? Well, if I had 16 of these subcarriers and they each ran at 25 gig, as an example, I could have a 400 gig optic able to talk to a bunch of different 25 gig destinations, 16 of them to be exact, and what I could do is have a high speed 400 gig now talk to a low speed 25 gig or 100 gig optic. We've never done that before because instead we bookended everything. A 10 gig talks to 10 gig, a 25 to 25, 100 to 100, a 400 to a 400. And we had to have the same speed transceivers on both ends of the connection. That's the left picture. What do we do when we want 400 gig here and we got a bunch of 25 gigs over here? We put an intermediate aggregation switch or router in that picture or a, or a transport device with, with packet functionality. And then we terminate these lower speeds. We send it back to the electrical domain, back to the optical domain, and then we transmit it at 400 gig on the right-hand side. What if we could eliminate that intermediate electrical aggregation and instead have these subcarriers talk to the higher speed optic? Answer, we could drive down the network cost significantly and make it more flexible. Let's take a quick picture here uh, and take a look. So we had in that case, we would have um, we would have sorry, one more back. Um, if we had um, 20 interfaces, we'd have 40 transceivers it, and um, and we'd still have this intermediate aggregation. With XR optics, we can eliminate that intermediate aggregation. We can almost half the number of uh, transceivers in plus one, and we could get this 70% reduction in network performance. Where could I apply this? I could apply this technology to all the kinds of places where I have low speed wanting to aggregate into high speed. That includes, think about 5G radios that need to backhaul back to the, to the disaggregated unit or the centralized unit. Um, think about 5G transport, high speed, and even uh, high speed broadband, or even PON overlay, where you could do an overlay of uh, this technology on the existing residential infrastructure for enterprise services. We know that XR Optics will take more than just Infinera, and um, um, this technology has been launched into um, something called the Open XR Forum, which was literally just announced this week at the OFC conference, and a list of service providers uh, and companies have joined, and we expect uh, others to do so as well, and this is a, a multi-source agreement style consortium um, that is meant to bring this point to multi-point uh, an XR optic technology to life across the ecosystem because we know that is needed. Let's wrap up right where we started, um, which was how are we going to accomplish our capacity growth mission with an, an intelligent optical underlay uh, over um, um, to support um, connectivity of people and applications to the cloud? Answer at least three pieces of the answer. We have advanced embedded uh, optical engines. We have this uh, revolution in kind of pluggables technology with point to multi-point functionality that can simplify the network and drive down uh, costs and, and less equipment. And finally, all of that goes into compact modular optical platforms um, that support um, easier integration from a software and a combination of pluggable and embedded optics. And with that, I thank you very much for your time and thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to be with you today. Sorry, I had to take myself off mute there. Tim, thank you very much. And um, I'm afraid we are, we are at time, we're a little bit over. Uh, so we're gonna have to, uh, to break there, but I, um, I did just wanna sort of uh, throw out something that a, a CIO said recently, which was, you know, you, you can't have telework without telecom, and uh, and thinking about the um, the connectivity that needs to go into the the modern era. You you did a great job of of explaining some of the the sort of the hidden plumbing here and, <laughs> um, and how we can how we can apply it. So I, I really appreciate that, and I, I hope we can uh, pick up this discussion again soon. Love it. Thanks a lot, Troy. Thank great to be here much. with you. Thanks, man.